Welcome back to How We're Unboxed. I still don't have my voice. <laughs> yeah, good times for you. Yeah, what are we doing? Oh, part three, Q&As. Yeah, more questions. I know it's, it's going to be brutal on your poor voice. I've had a few strepsils, so... Yeah, it should be okay. Don't yeah. overdo it on those. Yeah. So we've, got a, we've got a live stream to do after this. But anyway, more questions. Part one, two are on the channel right now. So if you want more questions and answers, go check those out. Uh, but yeah, let's get into part three. But before we do... Today's sponsor spot is brought to you by MSI and their NVIDIA GeForce RTX 30 series of graphics cards. For budget conscious gamers, the Ventus series offers loads of value with a no fuss performance focus design packing large triple fan coolers. Then for the next tier in performance and aesthetics, the gaming series offers low noise operation and eye catching LED lighting. Or for those of you after the best of the best, the Supreme series offers uncompromising performance through state of the art thermal design and of course, those chiseled good looks. And of course, all models do support ray tracing and DLSS. Also, viewers in Australia and New Zealand can go into the draw to win an epic MSI gaming bundle worth over $2,000 with the purchase of select MSI GeForce RTX 30 series graphics cards for a limited time. So for more information, please check the link in the video description. All right, with the current trend of budget PC hardware pricing and the success and simplicity of couch console, uh, do you see a difficult future for lower tier PC gaming? A difficult future for low, t sorry, yeah, lower tier PC gaming. Not really. I think this has always been the case. Is that consoles are always cheaper than PC gaming? Like, At least for initially. For I'd say almost all of the lifetime, because the consoles, yeah. especially with the latest couple of cycles, they've kind of done that mid generation refresh. Mm -hmm. um, True. You know, it's difficult to to build. A, a good quality PC for like five hundred dollars US, which is the cost of a, yeah. a PS Five. Like that, yep. that's pretty difficult. PC has always been that sort of next tier up. Mm -hmm. Like, yes, you can buy a low tier PC, and maybe that is slower than you'd get from a, a game console. But a PC can do other things as well. So you know, it's, it's always been that sort of, you know, do you want just the gaming machine that you can use on your couch or if it's the more social experience depending on the console you get or do you want something that you can use for you know browsing the web and I, making I think, spreadsheets yeah. and documents it's it's always a difficult discussion i don't think they compete very well between it like i think i think you're right and i think i don't yeah I, don't, I agree i don't think the discussions change that much i think low end pc stuff's pretty much what it's always been i think if anything we've seen a shift in there's more pc gamers so the pc ecosystem the pc platform is stronger and has more support and more users than ever uh it's it's now viewed more as a premium tier i remember years ago like many years ago there was always the debate between what's better you know pc gaming or console gaming and people yep. may on the corners of the internet still have that debate today it's a little humorous but i think now most people view pc gaming as the premier platform like the, the premium gaming experience because that's yeah. really what it is i think that's been the case for a while now as well yeah but um, it's it's very much so now even like i think people sort of blown away with the new generation of consoles what they could do 4090s came along and then in a couple of years 4090 levels of performance on the pc will be you know yeah sort of mid-tier and that's always the case though the first year to two years of a console coming out it tends to be you know they're usually sold either at cost or at a loss so then, yeah that was more my know, point because yeah. you get five six years down the track and even if they refresh them entry-level pc hardware is yeah but i think my point is even that even today you know obviously when the consoles come out ps5 and whatever you know they're targeting things like 4k sometimes 60 fps sometimes low resolution 60 fps whatever case is you know pc still is offering different resolutions higher frame rates high quality settings high quality settings superior ray tracing and that was the case right from the launch of those consoles now of course that a lot of those things at the launch are locked to the higher tier tiers so back then you would have had to be you know owning 2080 ti's or new ampere gpus to sort of access some of those features but you know it was still a level above but yeah, I think even with innovations like the Steam Deck, for example, it's kind of almost giving people more in the lower tiers because game developers are now thinking about, you know, how do we scale our games right down to the level of a Steam Deck, mm -hmm. which runs at what, like, most games run at 720p, sort of 30, maybe 60 FPS at 
the lowest possible quality settings. And so that helps all those people who are gaming on APUs and integrated graphics or are buying the absolute lowest tier products. If it's viable for Steam Deck, then it's probably gonna be viable for those very cheap entry-level desktops. Where that's a better experience than buying a console, again, it comes down to things like, what else are you using your, your console for? You know, mm -hmm. do you want more of a desktop experience? Do you want more of that sort of, you know, all in one, you know, gaming experience that's really focused on gaming? And there's no right or wrong answer there. It's not like you can sit here and easily say, yeah, low low tier gamers should all buy consoles mm -hmm. because there's definitely still reasons to to put that money into a, a PC instead. Yeah. So it's a very complicated discussion, I think, with this these sorts of yeah, these it sorts is. of things. Yep. Always the classic it depends applies. I mean, really, that replies to pretty much most things. People like to yep. look at stuff from a narrow lens, but really, a lot of people like to game in different ways, play different games, different yep. needs, different requirements. So that's the beauty of the PC platform, though. All right, Tim, can we name our top three best and worst products of 2022? So mm. I think we'll do this combined because otherwise, whenever we get asked these questions on the, the spot, I blank. Like, I can't <laughs> even remember. What did I review this year again? All right. Should we start with the best products? Sure. So do you want to nominate one first? Um, first? I'll go a controversial one, I think. All right. I'm going to say the RTX 4090 was one of the best products we got this year. And I know that's going to trigger a great many and I fully get it because it's disgustingly expensive. But the price aside, it's a very impressive product. Yeah, and I think it's fair now that we've seen both Ada Lovelace and RDNA 3 that NVIDIA was able to achieve a greater performance uplift than AMD, gen mm. on gen. So I think that improves its, its sort of impressiveness. Yeah, it's technically a very impressive yep. product. It is disgustingly priced. Yeah. But at the same time, it's like it's sold at that price. So yeah, I don't know. I'd like it cheaper, <laughs> but I live in fantasy land when I say that because that's not reality. But it, technically, very, very impressive product. Blew me away with how good it was. It was a genuine 4K ray tracing type product. Very cool. So I'm going to lock that in as a as a... As a top three? As a top three best product of the year. Yeah. I mean, I, obviously being a monitor reviewer, I can't go in 2022 not putting an OLED monitor in the top three because we finally got some good options. So Alienware AW3423DW, mm -hmm. finally getting that sort of gaming OLED. Obviously, not everyone wants an ultra wide, And again, it's quite expensive, but not that expensive considering I was expecting it to be more expensive. And obviously... 175 hertz OLED for HDR gaming. I've been using it for my personal gaming rig for many months now, and yeah, it's it's awesome. It's a great product. Okay. And yeah, we might see some more OLEDs next year, but certainly for this year, I think that monitor probably needs to go in the top three. Um, and now we need a third best. Well, I think probably the 5800X 3D was probably... I yeah. think the 5800X 3D is the, the people's choice for the best Definitely. product. I think yeah. that, especially when it got down like $330 US or something like that. The demand for it's been really high. It's sold well for most year, of the year. And it's so, still yeah. high now. So I think that's probably the ultimate best product of the year. Yeah. Um, just because it's it's technically impressive. It's 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 impressive in, in all aspects that you could look at it. Value, performance, yeah. uh, compatibility, what it brings to old systems. It's it's very, very good in that sense. Yeah. So I think that's probably the ultimate pick. Um, and then the monitor and the... Yeah, so yeah. Probably, probably reverse order of reverse how we picked order. them would be the order we'd go yeah. with. Now, worst products. Well, I think just because it's fresh in my mind, obviously top spot would be the 8 gigabyte RTX 3060, anti-consumer... Yeah, that was terrible. That was terrible. So that that's probably taking top honors there for the worst product. Uh, what are the bad? See, I'm bad with these on the spot. I really have to go back and look and refresh my mind of all the stuff we've done and we've yeah. looked at. Yeah, and it's it's difficult because like products like the 4080 and 7900 XT, mm -hmm. they're not technically bad or broken products, mm. but they're just they're really poorly priced. So do you lump? But them even into when you say really thing? poorly, it's like. Hundred and fifty dollars off and it's like, hey. Yeah, exactly. So it's not like it's not like yeah, they have exactly. to half the price. It's not that bad, but I know what you're saying, they are poorly priced. But they're not yeah. they're they're not technically bad products like uh, or or uh, anti consumer or whatever you want to put it, like the uh the eight gigabyte thirty sixty was. 
So I don't know. I'm drawing a blank on another bad product. Yeah, at least from the stuff I've, that we've covered in general on the channel, I don't think there's been any like cannot recommend this at all type. Yeah, type and products. that's not to say there haven't been bad products this year. There certainly would have been, but yeah. ones that we've come across. Yeah, uh, and certainly you know we've made you know more negative reviews of products like the thirteen nine hundred K, but that's still a good product. It's just that it, you know consumes a lot of power, mm. runs quite hot, and is expensive. It wasn't necessarily like, is it worthy of a spot? In it's still the fastest gaming processor. It's a good gaming CPU. So you know, I don't think that sort of no, really deserves. Definitely what about not. something like the Intel Arc A three hundred and eighty? When you covered that on the channel a while back, because back then drivers were much less mature. But it, but even within twenty twenty, it still become a decent product, like fairly solid with updated drivers and whatever. Mm. So it recovered within the time recovered, frame specified. Yeah. So even that's a bit unfair on Intel. And technically, you couldn't really buy it when I got it, at least, you know. Yeah, that's true. That's, that's um, true. So it's kind of hard. I think, like, we, we've put up, what, like, four other candidates of products that are sort of we were more negative on, but do I'm, they go as far as being bad? I'm looking around at boxes <laughs> to try and rejog my memory, but... Was the 6500 XT this year? That was a bad product. Uh, yes, I think that was true. this year. Yeah, I th yeah, I'm pretty sure it was. So, yeah. The 6500 XT, that's a good pick. If that was this year, which I think it was earlier this year. See, late last year, early blends in. Yes. Do it. You do a check. We'll do a quick Google of this. Um, I, I'm pretty certain it was early this year, though. March, maybe? January 19th. January, it was straight away. January okay. 19th. So 6500 XT has to count yep. in the list. Yeah, 6500 XT, that's a product I easily forget because I never really revisited it. We sort of looked at yep. it in that week, said it was crap, really bad <laughs> value, garbage product, tons of flaws, move on. Mm. Uh, and it it um didn't really recover. So I think that's probably like, you know, obviously we're not going to reach a, th a third product, I think, but... That's nah. pro probably the list. No, nah, I was struggling. R not... Raffle off those poorly priced products and mm -hmm. chuck one in the third spot if you really want to. But I think, yeah, I think clearly the uh, the 3060, 8 gigabyte, and the 6500 XT would be the worst products. So both, both graphics-related products. All right, we should probably move on to the next one. Yeah. All right. I don't think I've ever seen you speak very positively of DLSS's performance mode. And yet it seems very popular amongst the less technically inclined, uh, so Steam users, for example. Is this a case of people taking the positive reception, the higher quality preset of DLSS uh, to be true of DLSS in general? Or do you think DLSS performance mode has some use cases? So you've said good things about DLSS quality mode mm -hmm. and then not so great things about the DLSS performance modes. But yeah, I mean, I generally wouldn't recommend the performance mode if at all possible. But, I mean, if you've got a, a game and you've got a really low-end GPU, like an RT, what would be a slow GPU that you can actually use with DLSS, I don't know, a 2060 or 3050, something like that. If that's running at, let's go with. If that's running at 30 FPS in a game, you already have you know tried out various different quality settings. The performance mode, it's still an option. You know, it, it's... Better than nothing, right? Like, well, and it's still... are you better off lowering actual quality settings to get that gain rather than potato DLSS? I mean, I would prefer dropping from ultra to medium, but if we're already at the at medium, then often the low settings can look real bad. Mm -hmm. So, again, it's always that, that sort of bounce of things, isn't it? Like, there's there is a point where using DLSS performance mode is more preferable than dropping from medium to low. It's going to depend on the games and that sort of thing, but certainly. You know, in some games, the quality of the performance mode isn't amazing, but it's usable mm -hmm. at certain resolutions. And again, if you've got a low-end GPU, I think there's a reason to use it. But yeah, I think some of it does come down to sort of, again, DLSS is hard to analyze because it the visual quality changes significantly depending on the resolution and the quality settings and even the games that it's integrated in. So there's a lot of best-case scenarios you can use to, to look at how DLSS performs and what it looks like that don't apply in, in other situations. For example, if you're testing 4K and you're saying, oh, DLSS looks great, but then everyone's using it at 1080p, it, that doesn't align because mm -hmm. the 1080p quality is a lot worse than at 4K. Mm -hmm. And so that also holds true for quality versus performance mode. So maybe there is some sort of, you know, the positive feedback about, you know, most people primarily test 4K quality mode or 4K, the highest sort of, higher sort of presets. 
that people sort of go, oh, well, DLSS is good, therefore me gaming at 1440p or 1080p, I'm going to use performance mode because DLSS in general is good. But I think if you want to, you know, get into a more detailed analysis, it doesn't, that think, doesn't really hold up very yeah, well. I don't think that matters anyway, though, because they're not being misled. No. They're buying the product because that's a good feature, and it, but it yeah, may not necessarily be good for what they want, where you could say they were sort of misled in that sense, but... But it is still, like, to, in general, saying DLSS is good, I think, is true, because mm. there are still plenty of use cases and plenty of realistic use cases across all the GPUs where DLSS is very good. And yeah, 1080p isn't a great example. Performance mode isn't a great example. But the quality mode, 1440p, is very usable. I guess it would be if you usable. conflated that with performance. So yeah. if you will, if you if you did a lot of your benchmarking with DLSS enabled, which is one of the reasons why we avoid doing that as much as possible, because yeah, of, of what we're talking about now, it, the resulting performance could be very different, or the image quality could be drastically different. So native is king for that reason. Yeah, I mean, you're not t testing apples to apples, so it's yeah. poor, poor testing. But yeah. I mean, I think obviously there's people that don't notice the visual artifacts from the performance mode. That's, that's another factor. There are people who genuinely don't notice those things, which is, mm -hmm. which is fine. And, and also, you know, DLSS being, you know, temporal um, upscaling, if you are just pausing and looking at a static scene, like you just you're walking around this in the world, you stop and you look at something and you're testing all the different modes to see what looks really good, then the performance mode tends to look almost identical to the quality mode mm. when you're not moving. So mm -hmm. you've just got static on something, and I guess some people may choose to use the performance mode based on that. When you know you're playing the game, you're walking around or running, or it's a driving game, you're driving around, you'll start to notice all the instability and you know the shimmering and those sort of issues which is why we don't recommend the performance mode so again it's it, it's a very complicated topic as to why someone may or may not choose to use that feature um, but i don't think it being the performance mode being not great i don't think that should take away from dlss as a feature it's no we would it, officially say it depends yeah it's kind of like it's you can kind of ignore it because you know the quality mode is good so you don't mm -hmm. even need to it's like performance mode whatever it doesn't matter mm -hmm. the it's quality mode is good so yep. yeah I guess this one's more aimed at me. Would you retest Intel Arc with new drivers when new mid-range graphics cards from the red slash green team appear? Uh, yes, I would definitely update all of that data. Um, that's probably what I would update it for, to be honest, is, is for comparison with new um, AMD and NVIDIA current generation GPUs because at, at Intel, well, it looks like they've made great strides with the drivers. They've fixed, you know, DirectX 9 performance. They've improved performance in a lot of the newer games. They've made great strides. The reason I haven't looked at it is because can you even buy them? Not sure. I'm, the interest in them has been pretty low. Very low. Very low. I, I don't think it's sort of like a hot ticket item really, especially mm -hmm. with the current ease of buying a product like the RX 6600 for, mm -hmm. you know, well under $250 US. You know, those sorts of products getting cheaper. Used market is really running hot at the moment as well. So, you know, the interest for those Intel GPUs is, yes, not not amazing, especially, as you say, with it being kind of difficult to Yeah, to last buy. I looked, availability was non-existent, but it may have changed since I last looked. But basically, I'm more than happy to put in the time, and I will do that. It just doesn't make sense to create a dedicated video that is going to see very little interest and potentially hurt the performance of the channel. <laughs> So all of that updated data will just get included, as you suggest, in upcoming um, Ada Lovelace and RDNA 3 mid-range GPU yep. content. Okay, seems like we've got two similar questions here, so we'll, we'll do them back to back. Since you guys have a voltmeter, can you please check how much power does a monitor running at 60, 120, 144, 240 FPS pull from the wall? Don't think I've ever seen anyone actually test this. And second question, could you please start doing wattage tests what is usage tests mm. with monitors? For example, gaming with an OLED on PC. How is it at desktop gaming, web browsing, etc.? Yeah, so, so it's not a voltage monitor; it's a wattage yeah, monitor. It's power volts monitor. times amps, but yeah. Um, so all of our monitor reviews do have um, power consumption figures in them for monitors. I guess if you're talking about like power compared to the frame rate or the hertz of the monitor very minor differences. Mm -hmm. So the difference between running like 60 and 240 hertz on a monitor 
it might be one watt difference. So it's not like 60 frames to two no, on a GPU or a CPU? Not at all like okay. that. The majority, so the majority of where power consumption goes into the monitor is typically, for an LCD at least, the backlight. So mm -hmm. changing brightness will significantly change the power consumption. But yeah, running you know the panel at different hertz, again, doesn't really change the power consumption all that much with desktop monitors. Does it not hurt power usage? <laughs> Does not hurt power usage. You knew I couldn't leave that alone, that didn't one, you? Yeah. He already knew that was coming. He just looked at me and but, he's like, dad joking, coming. I knew it. I knew it. Um, there are obviously OLED monitors, the second part of this question, um, does differ a little bit from LCDs because OLEDs are self-lit, you know, the amount of pixels illuminated is going to affect the power consumption of the display. So if you're running a full white image as opposed to like a full black image, there is a big difference in power consumption on OLED versus an LCD where the power consumption is pretty similar between those two conditions. So yeah, for gaming on an OLED, for example, versus you know desktop web browsing, typically gaming will be at a lower power consumption level just because web pages, there's often a lot of white in them desktop apps, white in them. Depends if you're using dark mode or not, I guess. But you know, generally, for example, our test may show an OLED at, let's say, 100 watts versus a, an LCD may run at you know, 30, 40 watts. That's pretty typical numbers, mm -hmm. full white images. Mm -hmm. But then when gaming, the OLED may be back down around, say, the 50 to 60 watt range. Um, and that's because, yeah, the average picture level, so the average brightness of the image is not particularly bright, so you save a bit of power there. And generally, OLEDs, they consume a little bit more power than LCDs, but for most typical use cases, it's not going to be that significant of a concern. <laughs> yeah, and I it's mean... It's very similar. You're not concerned about power usage when you're comparing those two technologies. It's all about the image quality. That's right. And, and we're usually talking about sub-100 watts here, which... Mm -hmm. Again, your PC is going to be by far the dominant factor for total power consumption of your setup. Mm -hmm. Like you're talking about modern, you know, modern PCs using like four or five hundred watts easily, and your display using maybe fifty watts. Mm -hmm. I tend to think most of those times is fairly negligible. Obviously, you wouldn't want to see a two hundred watt display. That's not great, but most of the time, yeah, don't think it matters too much, and certainly doesn't vary significantly. Make plasma great again. <laughs> Based on your review data, do you think it was appropriate for AMD to use the names 7900XTX and 7900XT? For example, with RDNA 1, they chose to label the top card the 5700XT when it couldn't compete at the top end. Also, the XTX moniker sounds like it would just be an overclocked version of the XT. I would love to hear your thoughts on this. Uh, yeah, well, this comment might have been asked before my 7900XT review. Basically, I think the... 700 XT and then the XTX naming is garbage and AMD shouldn't have done it because as you say, the extra X sounds like it's some sort of rage mode gaming yep. OC type version when in fact it's you know a cut down version of the original at 17% slower but only 10% cheaper. Uh, the naming is confusing and some people might even be less tech savvy or less up to speed gamers might not even know that there's a difference between those two models. They might just think that they found a cheaper version or something like that, and then they're kind guess, of getting ripped it, off. You know, those new egg names are so long, it gets hidden in all that sort of... Yes, yeah. yeah. So I think the naming's crap, um, not very consumer-friendly. Uh, and as for the sort of naming of the, the GPUs, is the, was the 5700 XT given in there because they don't necessarily think that these RDNA 3 parts are truly the high-end parts that AMD will be offering for this generation? I'm not sure. I think that I think the example there was more that you know with RDNA one that was the fastest RDNA one card, but they didn't call it a 5800 sure. XT to compete with the what was it at the time the 2080 Ti back in that generation. Oh, so yeah, okay, yeah. I, I have less of an issue with that. I don't really care too much what they do there, as long as it makes sense within their own product stack. But the fact that like really it should have been the 7900 XT and the 7800 XT or the 7850 XT if you want to. Yeah, I'd say something like that would have made more sense. Again, it's like, you know, the naming doesn't matter. It's always the price to performance, as we've said on the channel. The name doesn't matter as long as it's not yeah. two different products with the same almost, or almost the same name. Yeah, that's right. So, I mean, you know, if they called it 7800 XT and priced it the same, would it really make that much of a difference? No. Um, not, yeah. not from that, that, not from no, that, not from that yeah, yeah. standpoint. Yeah. You know, I think AMD still wants to, give the perception that they're competing with the, you know, the highest end products by calling it 7,900. So they're trying to, you know, obviously it doesn't compete with the 4019 performance, but, you know, they are still, I guess, 
telling people that this is their best product. Whereas I think the 5700 XT, you know, that was only a $400 GPU, wasn't it? So I think with that naming, that kind of made sense because it was clear that they weren't trying to position it up against a 2080 Ti. Like mm -hmm. it's much lower price tier. So having a sort of lower tier name kind of makes more sense. But a $1,000 price point is still very high end. So I think 7900 XT does fit with the, the product that they've released. It's just mm -hmm. a matter of the two products being the same name. That's that's the bigger issue. Mm -hmm. um, if they call it 7800, it doesn't really change too much about it. And again, if they did, they'd get that feedback about, well, the 6800 XT was $700 mm -hmm. or just under $700. And now it's $1,000. What's going on there? Whereas with the naming they've chosen, you know, people can compare the XTX to the uh, the 6900 XT, $1,000, same sort of price point. Um, you know, they sort of, get a different benefit there. So yeah, don't make the names the same. That's the that's the main takeaway. Don't make the names the same. Everything else will take care of itself from mm -hmm. there. Why don't reviewers review the new budget CPUs for gaming performance with a mid-range GPU? We would like to know if upgrading a CPU is worth it or not. When the 13400 launches, I would love to see it paired with a 3060 or 3070 rather than 4080 or 4090. So what's the reason? Well, the reason is you think everybody games the same way you do is basically <laughs> it because, well, it goes beyond just this, but we don't like when we test something, I don't know how you play apex legends. I don't know how you play CSGO or Fortnite or any game really forget even multiplayer stuff like, you know, Warzone and all that where it gets complicated, even single player games. And then I don't know how single player games, in six months, 12 months, 18 months, 24 months. I don't know the requirements for those games either. So we basically isolate the component and just show you how it performs. This yeah. is what it offers, at least in today's games and what we have now when when uncapped. This is, this is what it can do. And that gives you the best idea of how they, they compare. Uh, by, by limiting the performance, what does it tell you? It's like if you've got an RTX 3060 and you play... Fortnite using the epic quality settings then it doesn't matter which one you use but that could be miles from the truth that could be insanely misleading so you're better off seeing what the difference is rather than just artificially hiding it yeah it's like you always want to isolate your variables mm -hmm. when you talk when you're talking about any sort of testing you know, it doesn't have to be benchmarking computer hardware it's mm -hmm. like if you want to find out how one thing performs you want to make sure you're testing that one thing as isolated as possible because we can't so test CSGO with every quality yeah. preset. If we could do that, then sure, it'd be a CPU, GPU scaling video with 10,000 data points, but we can't do that. So we, we just do what we, we show you uh, the, the most useful information essentially, which is what is the difference? Because if we tested mid-range low-end CPUs in CSGO with a, with a 3060 and we use the very high quality preset, then it would show that there's probably not that much difference between the CPUs. They all sort of, because you're limited by the 3060. But if you play CSGO with competitive quality settings, then that information is completely useless to you. And there may be, you know, a 10%, 20% performance uplift that could be had by using that. So really, we've talked about this a lot in the past as well. What you're requesting is a system test, like a specific system benchmark. And again, even that, as I said, is difficult because how do you, what quality settings do you use for that specific configuration? Yeah. There's no right way of going about doing a specific test because as I said, all gamers play games with different preferences. So we're better off just showing you ultimately right now in a CPU limited scenario, this is how much more performance you can expect. When AM5 VRM testing, oh, sorry. I thought he was going to say, when you're doing it, can you do something? That was the actual question. So when am I doing my AM5 VRM testing? Um, I know you guys have been very busy, uh, but I really need some good testing since all of them are $200 plus, and I'd prefer to choose something that works. Uh, something that works is always preferable. I have, I might get some B-roll, depends on what you have to, I have a big old stack of X670 motherboards. I have pretty much every single one. Um, I have every one but wah, bar one, wah one, bar one. Uh, so yeah, it's coming. It is coming. I've done all the testing. All the results are in. 
most of the B-roll's done. Uh, people keep re releasing products. There are three new products already that I have on hand, NDA signed for, for January. I'll try and get it out the second week of January. You're promising. I'm No, I'm trying. <laughs> okay. I'm trying not to promise. But it's a promise. So. But yeah, all the hard work's done there, guys. Uh, just got to script it up, put it together, film the video, edit it together. But all the testing's done, which took weeks upon weeks upon weeks. And then people keep releasing products and I don't get to get it out there. But I'm working on it. It'll happen January. I promise it'll happen in January. Okay. It'll happen in January. But specifically, you're promising the second week. I'm of January. hoping the second week. Okay. Yeah. Okay. It has been reported that the 7000 series, and we're talking about RDNA 3, the, the Radeon 7000 series, not the Ryzen 7000 series, it has an issue with high power usage with multi monitor setups. Is that something that can be fixed with driver updates or is it a design flaw? Mm. We, we were, I was going to say my guess, but let's be honest, we're both guessing. Yep. I would expect it to be something that's solvable via drivers. Yeah, probably. Because we've seen in the past high power usage and those sort of things have been solved via driver updates. Yeah, it depends how the display engine works, but generally, <laughs> generally Well, it depends speaking, what the problem is, obviously. Yeah, uh, that's true. I mean, if you know, display engines do need to clock differently depending on how much throughput you need for monitors. So if you're running... Well, three super high refresh rate 4K monitors, then it's going to need to do more work to run those monitors mm -hmm. than running a single 1080p 60Hz display. But generally speaking, they've found ways to you know clock down other parts of the GPU so you don't get these ridiculously high power consumption things. But I think this is just one of those AMD situations where they're, you know, they're working on fixing the main important stuff for you know releasing the GPUs. They've done all their optimization as much as they can. They sort of... I know multi-monitor isn't really an edge case because lots of people use it, but you know people will tolerate high idle power consumption until they fix it. So it's, yeah, it's a lower priority issue. Yeah, is what you're saying. they've deprioritized yep. it. Yep. But yeah, I'd expect the the driver team to be all over that, considering it was widely reported. Mm -hmm. All right, we are done. I'm going to go rest my voice. I probably don't have to film a video for a few more days, so hopefully it recovers. Hopefully, but anyway, that's a me problem. Um, I guess your problem is the Q&As are over. Oh, no. Let us know in the comments below. Do you prefer Steve's weird sick voice or his normal voice? Because you know how some people get sick and they get like a new gravelly, you know. My bat, my bat. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, maybe people like your Batman voice yeah. a bit I'm better. I'm Batman. <laughs> you made me now you have to do a whole video like yeah. that. I actually hurt. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, so let us know about that. But also, if you're heading down there to let us know in the comments about Steve's voice, we also in the description have our Patreon float plan. Oh, yeah, click that instead, actually. <laughs> we probably would prefer that you click on those. Uh, yeah. Join up, get our monthly live streams, our Discord chat, our behind the scenes videos. Um, what else? Not much all more. the stuff's there. You'll work yeah. it out. Yeah, all the but, good stuff. But thanks for watching, most, most importantly. Yeah, thanks for watching. I'm your host, Tim. I'm your host, Steve. See you next time.